Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being patient. We're so happy to have these three wonderful people here. My name is Madeline Warren, and I'm the senior director here at the gallery, who has the great privilege of working with the Ed Clark estate. And one of the things we talk about is when you are working with an estate, how do you bring in more voices? And so we are so privileged today to have these three wonderful people, Franklin Sermons, Hetty Clark, and Adger Cowens, to tell us their stories about Ed and memories and um, who knows what else they'll get into. So with that, I'm, I will pass the mic to you guys. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madeline. Um, well, first and foremost, let me just say, this is such an honor to be here with you two. Eddie, Adger, such an such a honor and a pleasure. And so I want to thank Madeline, I want to thank Russell, and everybody at Hauser & Worth for bringing us together. Um, and thank you all for taking time on a Saturday afternoon uh, to be here and to speak and think a little bit more about Ed. I mean, you've probably all seen the exhibition, which is incredible. Um, having seen many works over a long period of time, I, I don't know, I just feel like uh, the presence gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and you have such a variety of work um, on view, but we're gonna talk about the stories, I think, behind the work and um, what incredible uh, people we have to do that with today. I also just want to acknowledge Malenka Clark and, and her family, um, who's been so important. Um, shall we just dive in? Hedy, let's start with you. Where, tell us about yourself. Where were you? Uh, born and raised and come into this world. Okay. Um, I was born in um, Philadelphia and um, grew up in Philadelphia and went to New York when I was like 19 or 20. Um, and that's where I met Ed when I, shortly after I moved actually. I so was um, very young when I met him. Yeah. So, um, so when, when and where did you guys meet? I mean, I think the, you know, one of the things with, with the work on view and you see, uh, I'm thinking of like a painting from 1967 and then I, I immediately think, wow, I wonder what y'all were doing. <laughs> I wonder what was going on. Um, but even before we get to the paintings, uh, what brought you, you know, how did you meet? How did you come together? Well, I first met him at a party. I, I moved to Philly with a couple of girlfriends um, and uh, one of the girls had a friend who was going with Ed at the time, and that's how we learned about the party. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I went to a party that he was giving at his loft on 20th Street down in Chelsea, and um, it was my first experience with a loft. I mean, I was really young and very naive, and... Um, you know, the loft were, was full of um, artists, which I learned later. Um, uh, uh, Mary uh, Baraka, formerly, he was Leroy Jones at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, when we met, I, I noticed that he was handsome, but other than that, I didn't pay much attention. And he, he didn't pay much attention to me either. But... Um, my friend Barbara asked him to come over to do taxes for us because during tax season, that's how he would make some money. He'd come over and do taxes. And um, so that's, that's when he noticed me, which I didn't realize because he told me after I had come in the kitchen in a robe and for some reason, part of my robe was kind of open. <laughs> and I said, leave it to him to have noticed that. <laughs> so he called me a couple of weekends later and I thought he was calling in to talk to Barbara and they had gone at they had gone back to Philly so I was alone. So he said, "Now I called to talk to you, you know, do you want to 
I want to invite you to the museum at the modern we went. So I said, sure. And that's how it started. Wow. <laughs> this is what year? Do you, this is early 60s? This was 65, actually. Yeah. So 1965, Ed, I know he's beautiful, of course, right? Very handsome. Yeah. But still, 1965, the guy's got a loft on 20th Street entertaining artists and thinkers. I mean, it, it sounds like it's out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was out of the movies for me in a way because, you know, shortly after he told me he was going to Paris to have a show and he wanted me to come with him. And... Um, as a young teenager, I used to look at these films, these Apache um, films, and I don't know, I guess I was back 13 or 14, and I said, one day I'm going to go to Paris, and here is the opportunity. So I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's come back around to Paris. I was wondering, Adger, when did you meet Ed? Uh, I met Ed in the 70s. Okay. And uh, Bill Hudson introduced me to him. Bill had a, a loft on 19th Street at the time. He had just come back from Europe. And um, he saw my work. He said, you got to meet Ed, you know. You, you do something similar. I was doing comb paintings. And so he said, you have to meet Ed. So I went over and uh, I met Ed. And then he came around. We went back to Bill's studio and was looking at work. And talking and talking and this and that and the other thing. And he asked me to do some pictures for him, and I shot some pictures. And I brought him, he said, you're really good, man. He said, I had this guy doing this stuff, and it sucks, man. You, you really, and you just had a little thing like this. You know? So then after that, you know, we became really good friends, and he came to one of my shows of photography, and we just kind of started like that. And then he and Bill and I, we started hanging out and talking about, you know, everything that was going on in the day. Because at that time, you know, um, there weren't a lot of black artists showing in major galleries. So we got together and talked about what the business was about, what we were doing, and why we were doing it. And we all agreed that we were going to do the work and not worry about if it was going to be shown or not. We would all had little shows here and there, but nothing major. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't want to talk about that, but it, that's <laughs> the way it was, you yeah. know. Nobody cared about African-American artists or black artists or any of that, even black people. They weren't concerned about our work. They were looking at Picasso and people like that. But I think from that, we formed a union to support each other. We didn't actually say that, but we did. And I think um, I was in Ed's loft at least two or three times a week. You know, because yeah. he was on 22nd, and I went to the camera store a lot and saw it. Oh, he's buzzed. He said, what are you doing? He said, oh, come on up. And um, that's the way our relationship started. It's okay. So 60s, 70s. Um, you, we're talking about 20th Street. I mean, you also mentioned Bill Hudson having a place nearby. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some ways, you know, as somebody who spent a little bit of time in the studio, uh, I think I was jaded by the fact that, yes, he did have a studio here on 20th Street. Yes, there was this excitement. And Bill being there, you being there, and really an extension of a much wider circle. Um, like, in terms of community, I mean, I know you mentioned, you know, not necessarily having um, uh, collectors or, or people who were interested in the work in that moment. But there seemed to be a, a real strength in, in, in community, as you touched on. And was that something that was uh, uh, part of that neighborhood? Because I wouldn't think so. But, or how did that come about? I mean, well, or, or I was it that, elsewhere? You know, Ed was one of the few people that had a huge studio. You know, most of us had little places. I had a place downtown, uh, West Broadway it was pretty big. But I think that um, there weren't a lot of artists. Uh, Jack Whitten had a studio, um, but not a lot of artists had big studios. Um, I think Danny bought a building later on, 
on Prince Street. Danny. Danny Johnson. Yeah, Danny. Uh, Danny LaRue Johnson. LaRue. <laughs> Don't forget the LaRue part. <laughs> and uh, we was, used to hang out. I think, uh, who was in that group? Uh, Junior, Danny, uh, Peter Bradley, Al Loving, and myself. And we would drive around in Danny's big, he had a big station wagon. And we did things like go over to Brooklyn and pick up stuff off the yard, you know, where they did the ships and we'd come back and make stuff. And I think we went up to the um, Bronx Zoo to the exotic birds. Well, I can tell you, man, when I saw those exotic birds, I said, I'm not gonna paint anymore. <laughs> this, this, this is ridiculous. The colors of those birds, man. I'm telling you, I was really like, I'm through. I'm through. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm not gonna paint. I think I'm gonna go be a plumber or something. <laughs> I was like, this is, I mean, the, the fineness of the colors. And we went back, you know, to Danny's and we sat down. We, talked about it all, and we decorated our heads, you know, and talked about what that was about, how those colors were made, you know, from nature, and there was no way that we could make those colors. It was totally impossible. Mm -hmm. And then they started coming out with the shiny stuff and pearl, and all, but still it was not anywhere close to those colors. And we talked about color a lot, you know, about what it meant, you know, the rhythm of color, how different parts of the body relates to different colors. I mean, we got pretty deep into what that was about. But that was the community, and we all supported each other. We mm -hmm. went to each other's shows, you know. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, somebody said, man, I'd like to get that color. And it's okay, I, I, you know, here, take a tube of that. You owe me now. <laughs> <laughs> But it was, it was a very tight group of people. Yeah. And there were very few people who were not artists that were in that group. There were a few. Yeah. You know, some of the collectors would come around and that liked the artists and knew what we were up to. But it was, it was pretty quiet, knit group, you know. Yeah. And Hedy, you, you studied um, social work. And how did, uh, did that come up in conversation with Ed, or were you? Did you even know he was an artist when you first met him? Obviously, well, being in the yeah, loft. Yeah, I did. I knew he was an artist, but social work part was done after Ed and I had separated. So, um, I mean, I I knew he was an artist, and I really, you know, really thought I I knew nothing about art at the time, but I thought his paintings were really beautiful because of the colors and the motion and um, so when we went to Paris um, you know he was having the show at Cruz and Cruz gave him a studio to paint and he painted um, and we were there longer than I thought we were going to be there because um, we were going and I told my father you know, that I was going to Paris unmarried <laughs> with this man, much older than I was. He wasn't too pleased. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Ed likes to tell the story when I brought him to Philadelphia that my father was sitting there cleaning his shotgun, but that wasn't true. <laughs> So my dad asked me when I was coming back, I said, I don't know, you know, we only had a one-way ticket. I didn't know when I was coming back. So that was that. <laughs> oh my God, now I know where the shotgun story comes from. <laughs> he used to threaten me about with that. that. <laughs> you talk about the shotgun. I think he used to threaten me with that when Malenka was walking around the studio, actually. <laughs> now I know where it comes from. So, so late 1960s Paris, um, you know, thinking about a party with someone like Baraka in attendance, what was, the, what was the mood of you guys being in Paris in the late 1960s? What did that feel like? It was great. I mean, everybody was there and everybody passed through there. Um, you know, we were in Montparnasse, that was the neighborhood. We were at the Dome in La Capole mostly every night. So there were people, you know, Chester Himes came through, Ollie Harrington, Gentry, who was living in Sweden at the time, 
and no matter where people were going, they'd always stop in Paris. So, and Ed knew everybody. And um, so it was great. There is nothing like it, really. Incredible. Um, Herb Gentry uh, was probably, uh, I think, 10 years older than Ed and probably coming from in somewhat a different um, space. Um, what, was that, what, what was that like, uh, seeing him interact with other artists in that, in, in that time? Well, it, it was uh, wonderful. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Gentry was 10 years older than, um, than Ed, but um, Ed told me, you know, Gentry told him that he had married a child, which I was, but... Um, <laughs> yes. No, no. no. <laughs> but... Um, I mean, the experience was great. Yeah. I mean, we, di we didn't have any money, but it was, it was really incredible how resourceful Ed could be in getting money. Um, I remember once he had made a portrait of me, and mm. we would go to the cupole, and the owner of the cupole, Rene, he would walk through the cafe every night talking to the patrons, and he would always stop with us at us and, and chat, you know, we'd be sitting there with a Van Rouge and a, and a coffee because that was all we could afford. But um, anyway, we were, we were trying to get the rent up for the next month and it said, so, well, you know, I think I'll sell this painting or try to sell this painting to Renee. He likes you, I know he likes you, so he'll buy it. And <laughs> I was like horrified. <laughs> I felt like I was being pimped out, really. <laughs> but um, actually, Rene did buy it, but he told him, he said, I'll give it, you know, I'll keep it for a while, and then I'll give it back. Wow. And I don't know if he sold it back or just gave it back, but we have it now. But, you know, thinking about it, I, I was thinking Rene probably knew we were desperate that he probably didn't want to sell that painting, but he felt, you know, he had to, and which was really kind, I thought, yeah. It's an incredible painting. Yeah. And Adger, so just segueing to that, back to that studio experience in New York and thinking about the, the time, I mean, just trying to think through, you know, the, the political moments um, that were part and parcel, I think, extending into the 70s, did you also spend time in Europe? And, and I know you've mentioned being in Ed's studio, I think, when he was gone at times. Uh, no, I didn't spend time with Ed in, in Europe. I went to Europe later on, but by then Ed had come back. Uh, I think Bill Hudson had just left. So the uh, um, only, only person I hung out with I went there was Ted Jones. Uh -huh. Um, the, the writer Ted Jones, so mm -hmm. also somebody coming from a cultural sphere. Um, was there a lot of, of in that kind of intermingling writers, artists, musicians? I mean, yeah, a, a lot of artists and writers went to Europe because it was more open. They went to, I mean, I went to Copenhagen and London, and, and, and there were a lot of artists around, <clears throat> black American artists who were there because. Now, there's much more freedom there, you know, among the people because they like jazz and they liked artists. So it was uh, it was more homogeneous, I'll say, in terms of if you were walking down the street, people wanted to know who you were, you know, because they knew you weren't, a, you know, European, but the way you walked or your hat or your clothes, they were always very interested in what, um, you know, African-American artists were doing. Very much so, all over the place. How did Ed take to that, to that conversation? I mean, talking about the music, talking about being an artist in that time. Well, our, you know, uh, Ed loved music, you know. He didn't play a lot of music when he worked, though, but he was very knowledgeable about who people were, and, and he really loved music, you know. But uh, Ed usually painted without any music. You know, and there were some artists. There were some artists that painted like uh, Peter Bradley. Always had music. He said, I can't paint without music. 
you know, I, I have playing music too, you know, I got jazz music and all, you know. But I think a lot of Ed's inspiration, I'll say that, that women really influence the way Ed painted, very much so. You mean the physicality of it? <laughs> yeah. And he talked, he talked about women a lot, you know, he, he loved women and, uh, you know, I think it was just part of his DNA, you know, he really gravitated toward the feminine principle. Right on. <laughs> 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 tell me, tell me, um, so you're, you're working more as a photographer in this time period in the 70s, right? <laughs> Try and give us a, a little bit more of that picture. And I know um, one of the things I, I was curious about is, um, you know, you mentioned some of the artists. Um, I think also Buford Delaney was in Paris in addition to, to Buford Baldwin. Buford was at our marriage. Oh, God, really? Yeah, one of the three witnesses. Wow. We got wow, married wow. in Paris, by the way. Yeah. So wait, what, so what year did you marry? And uh, please. In... Um, 66, May of 66. Okay, so like yeah. right at the beginning when you were over there. Well, you know, I kept getting these letters from my mom and my aunt talking about what good Catholic girls should be doing, <laughs> not living with a man <laughs> unmarried. So uh, there was some pressure, yeah. So we decided why not, you know, so... Yeah, so uh, we didn't know French at the time, but we went, we had to figure out how we were going to do this. Some people thought it would be easier to get married in London, and then they said, no, may, you know, maybe you can do it here in Paris, and that's what we did. So Buford and another couple, uh, Keith and Maria De Carlo, they were there, and they were translating for us. <laughs> wow, Keith Murray, the musician. No, he oh. was a um, an artist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, did Did Ed talk about Buford Delaney at all, and in, in terms of the work? Well, yeah. I mean, we visited Buford all the time. You know, his studio. In fact, uh, Buford was supposed to do a portrait of me, or we, it was talked about, but unfortunately, it never happened. But yeah, we, we saw Buford a lot. It's so interesting. I mean, I think about um, Ed and, and reference. He, he talked about Picasso a lot, you know, as, as this kind of uh, figure to push through, this figure that he uh, looked up to as an artist. And, but thinking about somebody like Buford Delaney, because I, I often wonder, like, what gave him the, the, the chutzpah to be the character that he is? Um, Sometimes he talks about the Basin family in New Orleans as being so foundational to, to, to giving him the sense that he could do almost anything. And then to be marrying you in Paris in 1967 sounds not only romantic, but um, it's, just, it's not the average everyday thing. So I'm just trying to feel like... Well, Ed, you know, he knew he was an artist and... <sighs> He knew that he was going to paint no matter what. And the work was always first. And he always knew he was, he was going to do the work no matter what. And, you know, when we were in Paris, it kind of... We were very fortunate in one way. Um, even though we didn't have any money, the, when, you know, opportunities came up... Um, the biggest one, the, the place we felt stable, because when we initially went there, we lived in hotels, and then he applied at the Cité des Arts. Um, and so we got in there, so we had a place to stay for a year. And um, so he had a studio, he was able to paint. And then when that year came to a close, Joan Mitchell offered us her place in Victoria to stay. So, you know, it's kind of one thing led to another. And, um, you know, he always had found the resources to paint. He was always going to paint. 
And he said, you know, if I don't do anything else, I'm doing this. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a couple of beautiful paintings downstairs from exactly that moment um, that didn't realize how large in scale some of them were. And I imagine that happens uh, in the studio when you were at Joe Mitchell's place. Yeah. <laughs> like in Paris where the lights would go out if you're not on the stairway, <laughs> you're not moving, no light. <laughs> exactly. Um, did you guys, so did you guys meet and did you know Adger in New York in the 70s? Did I? I don't, yeah. What was that later? I mean, there were so many... Um, like I said, Ed knew everyone and was so open, um, you know, inviting people, having people come over. And, um, you know, a lot of the people I don't even remember, mm -hmm. but we certainly remembered Adger. <laughs> it's a special relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, Adger, what, and I'm just thinking of um, your relationship with Gordon Parks. I mean, I think it, helps to have someone generationally who uh, is someone that you look up to. Was Gordon that for you? Uh, yeah, Gordon was that for me because when I was in school at Ohio University, um, you know, there weren't any black students, you know, studying photography. And uh, my father, when I first got out of high school, I said I was gonna be a photographer. My mother said, well, there was a magazine. My sister's boyfriend had a magazine in photography at that time. And he said, uh, <clears throat> look at this magazine. And in it, it said, Ohio University gives degree in photography. This was 1954. And um, so I showed it to my mother. My mother was an amateur photographer. She said, oh, that's interesting, you know. Um, my grades weren't that good, so, you know, I couldn't go to a one of those bigger schools, but OU was a state school. So she said, you have to show it to your father when he comes home. So I showed my father, so I'm gonna be a photographer. My father, they said, what are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? He said, you better get something in your head. Kodak makes a camera, they send you the film, you shoot the picture and send it back. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, you better, you better get something in your head. So my mother said, but honey, that's what he wants to do. So off I went in 1954 to Ohio University. And um, I, there were no black photographers that I knew. You know, um, I didn't know any white photographers. I didn't know any photographers. So uh, I was introduced to Ansel Adams and Weston because my teacher was Clarence H. White. Jr., whose father, Clarence H. White Sr., was part of Stieglitz's gallery. And you know, Stieglitz is considered the father of American photography. So that was my upbringing to learn photography is art. So it must have been toward my junior year, I, my uncle said, why don't you ask your teacher if there's you know, somebody black? And I said, well, in those days he said, Negro. So, <laughs> I asked my teacher, he said, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know of anybody. He said, but I think there's a guy at Life Magazine, Gordon Parks. So that year there was a magazine that came out, Life Magazine Photographers. I saw his picture and I wrote him a letter. Because we, we used to go back and forth from school because we loved jazz. And when Miles was at Carnegie Hall and Monk was at Five Spot, our teacher, David Hosteller, sculptor, he said, after the last class, we're going to New York. So, <laughs> and we would sneak to New York, you know, and hear the jazz. So I was there one of those weekends, and I called Gordon. And he said, well, you know, why don't you come up to the house? I said, okay. So I went up there, and uh, he was living in White Plains. And I got on the train, and I went up there, and I was waiting. And I saw this Thunderbird, powder blue, let it turn the corner. <laughs> black man smoking a pipe. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this is 1956, 50, wow. 50, yeah, 56. 
damn it, Thunderbird, with the top down, smoking the pipe. And he pulled his arm on Gordon Parks. <laughs> I said, I'm going to be a photographer. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm going to be a photographer. Because before, you know, first year in school, what did I do? Party, second year, party. Third year, I better get serious. You know? But I think that really cemented in my mind that the possibility that you could make money taking pictures. That was like far-fetched for me at that time that you could... You know, that was a job, that it was a job. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got out of school, I came back and Gordon asked me what I wanted to do. I said, well, I don't know. He said, where are you? I said, I'm at the Y. And he said, get out of there. I, well, I didn't know what was going on, you know. <laughs> These guys, I saw guys playing with each other in the shower, but I, you know, I'm square from a while. I don't know nothing. <laughs> he said, get out of there. And he said, come up here. So he came and got me, and I went up there. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you live here with me and work with me at Life Magazine? And uh, he said, um, I said, really? He said, yeah. Well, that kind of thing was like a dream come true for you know, a young photographer. So I worked with him at Life Magazine the whole summer, 1958. Wow. And then I went into service. Wow. Did you, did you talk about, did you and Ed talk about the differences or the likeness of, of photography and painting, you know, when you moved into painting? I mean, when you moved into photography? Um, no, we didn't talk about the difference. We only talked about images, mm. you know, what an image does and, and how an image moves you, whether it has enough emotion in it. You know, we talked a lot about spirit, you know, and emotion. I mean, that was always my lesson to, you know, people that I taught or people that I, you know, in the Kamonge group. It's always about the spirit. You know, just because you're black and you take pictures of black people, that doesn't make it hard. It has to be something in that that connects with people emotionally. So we talked about that. And Ed and I talked that about in terms of paint, you know, mm -hmm. the different colors. And when paint, and he was in, in Paris all those times, you look at those Paris series, a lot of pink and a lot of blue. Yeah. You know, because the skies in Paris, the blue has not... And there's no place else in the world that has a blue like the skies in Paris and that pink color in the evening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could see it in Ed's work. And he was very influenced by it. He loved Paris. He loved Paris. So I think that it's a more when we talked about images and art making, it always had to do with emotion. Mm -hmm. If there was something in there that somebody looked at that they could get something from. In other words, enrich, enrich their knowledge or understanding, you know, mm -hmm. based on their visual history. You know, if you've been looking at paintings all your life, you're going to have a different feeling about from somebody that's just started to look at paint. Absolutely. Wow. Well said. Um, and Hedy, so how, how did um, you guys come back to New York? Um, what, was that, that, what was that time period and what was that like? Well... We came back um, in 69. We, we were at Jones, I guess, for a little over a year. And um, we couldn't see any way forward in Paris, really. Um, Joan was, she would come out on the weekends while she was getting the studio ready. And um, Ed was painting the studio and then uh, Rhea Pell, Joan's partner at the time, suggested that now that Ed was finishing painting the studio, he should be painting paintings. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. So he did that for a while until Joan was ready to move there and um, take over the studio. So we didn't have anything coming up at that point. Mm -hmm. And we thought it was time to move on. And we stayed at um, a friend of ours, Nicole, in Paris, who was a um, girlfriend of Larry Potter back in the 50s before he passed. And she was, she was really very cool um, and very hip, 
very hip to the black American um, scene. You know, she she knew English. She she knew all the slang. She knew everything. So she let us stay there until it was time. You know, I left first, and it came several months after, and then we came back to New York. Yeah. To live back in the loft. Um, was that no? Um, when we initially came back, we had no money, <clears throat> so the loss at that time, you, if they had, um, you know, if they were fixed up, had plumbing and kitchens and all that, and people expected you to pay what's called key money. So even though you were renting it, you would pay the renter, you know, for, for what was in there. So I naively thought, well, I could ask my father for the money. After all, he didn't spend $5,000 on my on my wedding, like he did for my sister, so certainly he could give me money for this. <laughs> but, you know, he said no, he didn't have it. And I kind of thought he could, you know, he was kind of looking askance at my lifestyle anyway, artists and, you know, no money and all of that. So we, um, we found a, what, they, what was called a raw, loft and Ed was very good with his hands so he um you know he didn't do the plumbing we had someone to come in and put in the kitchen and all of that but he was good at dividing lofts and doing all that so um the first loft we had was on um 23rd and 9th Avenue yeah somehow we always managed to stay in Chelsea and then when we left that place, he went over to 22nd and 5th, and that's where he stayed. Yeah. What was it like being back in New York? I mean, at that time, did, were, were there exhibitions? Was, was that doing shows at that moment, or not so much? No. Um, it, was, it was good being back. I mean, I loved New York when I was that age. Um, things were happening, you know. Um, we just kind of, I found a job um, and it started painting and, you know, I think initially he had to rent a place to show, so it wasn't easy getting a show. No. No, definitely. I mean, it seems like a, a challenging moment, especially after coming from Paris and having that, I don't know, at least that sense of um, belonging in a way of being somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so, moving forward, um, thinking about uh, that moment, I think Malenka comes along not so far after that, I imagine. No, she came along a long time after that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Am I dating you? Uh, yeah. Um, you want to talk about Malenka? <laughs> No, just trying to think about that that period of coming back to New York and and trying to make it work, and well, obviously was, this beautiful thing does happen. Yeah, yeah. it was a struggle, um, but um, I did You know, he sh he showed in a couple well a couple of places, Don Joe's studio, and then as I said, he he rented this place to show, and. Um, and there were, you know, other things he, he was doing. Um, and when, that, when, well, he was, all, he was always, uh, he always loved women, so he was, you know, you. always out there. And um, when we decided to have a child, um, I thought, well, you know, I, I've spent, I guess many women feel this way. I, I've spent a while in this relationship and I want to feel like I get something out of it. So I got Malenka. But it, and it was so funny because I knew it was going to be a girl and I knew he would be a good father, you know. Um, because the thing about him that he, he was very nurturing. 
yeah. which is uh, you know really good quality to find in a man because it's usually you know the province of women. But he he was he was a nurturer, and even though you know as you know he went on to his next wife, but even though um, we didn't stay together as man and wife, he was always part of my family. And um, so that's how we, you know, we got along very well in that way, because he was very generous, both in his, in his, um, you know, caring, and he, he was just very open, and I always felt very safe with him. Uh, you know, I always felt that he would have my back, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Adger, there's a photograph in this incredible new book um, of you and Bill on top of, uh, you, Bill, and Ed on top of the uh, studio building on 22nd Street. I'm just wondering, what, what, tell us first about that image, because I can't figure out who took it. I took it. <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't know, I think we were all fooling around and uh, I said, you know, let's take some pictures. I like to do, you know. And I went over and I took some pictures with uh, Ed and Bill and Malenka. And I said, well, let me get in this. I, you know, I had a self timer. And I, I think the original images I were four by five and then I shot those with eight by 10. And I said, you know, we got to do a shot in front of the Empire State Building. That's just wrong you know, because in Ed's studio at that time, you could look out and you could see the Empire State Building. Right. But there was a cut because of the window. I said, let's go outside. And uh, so I set up an 8 by 10 camera and I put it on a timer and shot a picture of the three of us. Such an incredible image. Um, give me a... One moment uh, that uh, you remember fondly within that, that period of, of the 1980s? Malenka. <laughs> <laughs> she came out, she was little, you know, <laughs> and she was standing around and shooting pictures, and I said, come on, come on, get in the picture, you know? <laughs> and it was really interesting because, you know, she really loved her dad a lot, and, and it was just uh, a beautiful picture from that same, same day. Uh -huh. You know, and um, I just remember being Ed in Ed's studio when he would go away in the summertime, I would use his studio. And then sometimes he would come to my studio and with Malenka and, you know, um, Bill Hudson and be a couple of the artists around. We'd sit around drinking wine and talk stuff, you know. But we were like our own little family, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we never talked about galleries or museums or anything. We just had our friendship with each other and our kids and whatever. So it was, it was that kind of thing where I don't think it's so much like that that artists deal a lot with other artists because, you know, as an artist, you work alone, first of all. You, know, you don't have a crowd. But we were, like, very um, supportive of each other in that way, not just painting, but, you know, we went to things in our families and back and forth. I may mean, have a great shout out of Malenka and her father, just the two of them, you know. So because, well, there wasn't a lot that you could, you know, go to as a painter. There weren't that many shows. Mm. So, um, and Ed would rent a place and show his work. I did that too, you know, and, and invite people. I would invite people up in my studio and hang up stuff and invite people. That was the way we had shows. Or continue to have what I call a feeling from the people about our work, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was important. I showed some things with George Preston. He had George's here. Yeah. He had a little place uptown, and uh, we had to show some of my photographs. So it was that kind of thing, like home, homegrown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me see. George is here. Um, yeah, George. Ollie Tausch is here. I mean, there, there's an element of, of there being a place also, I think, to create some of that community within commercial spaces as well, mm -hmm. which I always find so interesting because you touched a little bit upon, you know, the interest of people. It's almost like there was a scene, uh, there was a black scene, and there was a wider scene. 
Um, so there was that, that platform, at least to some degree, right? I mean, there were times that, uh, you know, Romy would come to some of our shows, you know, um, and I knew Jacob, you know, Lawrence and Norman Lewis lived around the corner for me. Right. And so did Romy. He was on Canal Street. I was on West Broadway. And sometimes if I went up to the store, you know, I'd call Romy. He'd say, come up. You know, and we sit there and talk and bullshit, you know. I remember he was working on a painting one time, and I went over. And um, he was doing this huge painting. He had all these pins on the table. And he'd go over and he'd get a pin and pin some felt. I mean, he'd come back. He's going back and forth. I said, Romy, you know, you know. <laughs> I said, you know, you keep going back and forth. He said, well, add you this, you know. You know. I said, well, okay, I'm going to get a present for you. So I went and got a pin cushion for him, you know, and he could wear it on his wrist. Oh, he loved that. He was like, he's so agile. Look, I don't have to walk back and forth. Because the painting was big. He was walking back and forth. Back and forth. So I did some shots in with a little pin cushion there. But, you know, those kinds of things. My friend Mailer Ryder, who was teaching at RISD, was a homeboy of mine. He wanted to meet Romy, and I called Romy. He said, yeah, come by. He was very open to having, you know, people come by. I mean, it was just, you know, I don't know. Nancy Grossman called me one time. She said, why don't we do something for Romy while he's alive? You know, people honor you after you die, and they say you did this. And I said, well, what are you thinking about? She said, let's have a dinner. Well, I was an artist and resident at Green Street, you know. Tony Goldman had Green Street, and we were artists and resident. So I told him, we want to have this dinner, man, you know, for Romy. And so uh, he owed me money. <laughs> so I said, okay, put that money toward us having this dinner for Romy. And then Nancy put it in half. And so we had this wrong <laughs> dinner for Romy, you know, and uh, we invited him, you know. And I, I invited people I knew that knew Romy and that he knew. So he, he comes in really late, you know, everybody's eating, and he sits down and he says, he says, Adja, he said, he said, what is, what's this about? <laughs> I said, Romeo, it's a dinner for you. I thought he was gonna cry. He was like, so honored. And uh, so we ate and then he said, let's go to my place. And we went around the corner and we were up all night long. The artists, you know, Verdi made, just a whole bunch of people were there and playing music and talking. And at one point, Romy said, play my song, play my song. You know, <laughs> Sea Breeze, Sea Breeze. So he played Sea Breeze and we were up all night long. I think it was like six o'clock in the morning before we left. And I was so happy and Nancy just was overjoyed that we had really honored one of our own, the artists without having a big to-do about it. It's just, you know, and it was fun, it was great. And I, that's something I'll remember for a long time. That's fantastic, thank you. Ed was there. He, of course, <laughs> of course. He said, of course. what can I eat? I said, well, you know, we have either steak or lobster. You know, he said, I want steak. He said, two of them. <laughs> but it was, I don't know, I, you know, you have these times and they come, and if you don't embrace them, and they're gone, they're gone, they don't come back. And Always I just think that's so important, you know, to, to honor and to live and understand those artists in your time, you know, some respect. Absolutely. And Hedy, um, I know you're, you're working on a memoir, and wondering if you could leave us with one of the, the nuggets um, from your book or of a fond memory that you have. Memory that I have. Um, Yet another. <laughs> well, there are so many. I mean, um, I had a, a really great moments with Ed, of course, our time in Paris. And, um, and even after, um, you know, the, the, the visit to Jack Whitten and, and um, Crete. Wow. That was great, you know, flying into Paris and then renting a car and driving down the coast through Yugoslavia, what wow. was Yugoslavia at the time. 
and then down into Crete. And um, that was great. That there are just so many. I don't. How I long don't were you guys there? How long? Yeah. How long were you guys there in Crete? Um, I don't remember to tell you the truth, but Jack invited us down there, and we were on this in this little town called the Giagalini. And it was for it was before the tourists had gotten there, and you know, they I, I remember they had um, movie theater was like in the plaza. You just came and and they set up the screen, and um, Jack was a great diver. He'd go and he'd get he'd he'd always bring back octo octopus. He'd go down and bring back the octopus and. Um, take them to the nearby restaurant, and they would cook it for us. And um, it was it was great. Yeah, I, I can smell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I think can we take a couple of questions, Madeline? Yeah, in a way. Um, I guess I got out of, thank you for the question, Madeline. Yeah, um, I, well, my father collected, um, my father started collecting art, I think, in the late 1960s, and so uh, Ed was around and probably came to our house, um, Adger, definitely, and, and Jack, and uh, many others, and so I got to meet, um, Ed, I think when I was probably his grandkids age perhaps and um, didn't think a lot of it and one summer um, needed a, a job and Ed was kind enough to allow me to be I think I think he had uh, let me say I think he had the nerve to call it an assistant <laughs> but really it was like cleaning and um, basically I gathered receipts for like three months of a summer once um, but then came back and, and re really just got to hang out with him at a time when I had no inclination at all whatsoever for art or, or anything like it and had no idea that that was um, what I would choose to do as a vocation. So in many ways it really was, you know, it was exactly seeing those types of experiences and feeling the sense of, I think, freedom that has been touched upon and admiring that and believing that there was a space for creativity to be um, the central part of how one goes about living. Um, of course, my father did say the same thing that um, Adger's experience was, which was, you're gonna do what? You, you, wanna, you wanna sell art? Um, so yeah, some way, somehow he got, got through that. But um, yeah, I, I spent, um, a good summer in the studio and kept coming back and kept coming back and um, got to be a fly on the wall a lot of the time. I rem never forget the, the Van Der Zee photograph of Malenko, which is, I think, from 1983, which was always, always there, and Ed would refer to it. I mean, you hear about his sense of warmth and his, his sense of being a dad, and I, I try to take some of that. I have a 13-year-old daughter. So that's kind of, that, that's where I um, got to come into the conversation and, and was blessed to then do an exhibition in 2014 in New Orleans um, called Prospect in which we were, we, I got to go back in the studio now as a quote unquote uh, curator and, and sit around and, and talk to Ed and actually like look around at the work um, that was in the studio. There were so, so many paintings. That's why I think about the 70s, like, and, the, and the, the opportunities or lack of opportunities at certain times that I know was there, you know, to go in the studio in 2013 and see some of the absolutely phenomenal work that we're just beginning to see and beginning to understand. And, and this show reminds you that there are still so many ways in which to understand the work. So looking forward to that. But in 2014, we specifically thought about the relationship to New Orleans, and I, I can't remember what year he made the Louisiana Red series. It might have been 2008 or something, and he showed with Stella Jones in New Orleans, and so we, the three of us basically got together and talked about that work, 
and did an installation in New Orleans Museum of Art um, right as a pairing with Joe Mitchell because um, Joe Mitchell had the, the residency project that, that is in New Orleans and so it was a way to, to think about that again. So, yeah, no, thank you for that. Hey, George. Uh, George Nelson Preston. Um, I noticed that um, uh, Sheila Milder, uh, Jay Milder's uh, wife, and Rivka Milder are here. And this reminds me of something very interesting. Um, Ed and I went over to see Emilio Cruz. And Emilio had a loft on um, Delancey Street near the bridge. And when we got there, uh, Jay was there, Red Grooms, Bob Thompson. Wow. And there was this uh, Maxwell House coffee jar sitting in the middle of the floor, stacked with marijuana. <laughs> uh, Red and Aid didn't smoke. They, they drank wine. Anyway, we really got high. And <laughs> as, as night fell, we decided to go over to the Cedar Bar. The Cedar Tavern, which is where everybody went from that uh, 10th Street School of New York milieu. Uh, Bob had a jalopy, okay, and you could see the pavement through the floor of, of, of this car. So the six of us pile into this car with Bob Thompson driving the wrong way up 2nd Avenue. <laughs> And then making a wrong turn, I don't remember, it was either second or third street, where this cop stops us. And we've got this Maxwell house. I don't know why we brought it with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th this thing is in the glove compartment. And, you know, this is like 1960 with this interracial group of, you know, bohemian looking guys, <laughs> like sardines in this car. The cop comes over, he takes out a flashlight, and he looks at him and he says, you guys are crazy, get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and directs us back. And I often wonder what it would have been like if there had been a different cop. Yeah. 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 Wow, thank you, George. Hi. Um, Hey, Ming. Hi. Uh, uh, Max Roach, uh, the famous jazz musician, he used to follow around Elizabeth Catlett. And I was in Baldwin, I used to see Baldwin, James Baldwin, who was over there, I guess around the same time. Uh, he would, I would see him at all the jazz concerts. And I was wondering, during that period, did Ed Clark and his crew have any musicians? Also, I also wanted to know if there was connections with uh, Catherine Dunham, uh, because she was over there when I was traveling in Europe, I would meet a lot of Catherine Dunham's ex-dancers who were stranded over there, like Don Cherry was in Scandinavia, and there would be a, a Catherine Dunham uh, uh, dancer that was there and was teaching. So I wanted to know for, you know, from his wife or Adger. Um, I met Catherine Dunham when I first came to New York. My friend George Preston, now George West was a photographer. And I, at that time, I didn't know who she was, but uh, she was older then and he was photographing her and he had a studio on Canal Street and I went down there. And I, I met her, and uh, then I looked up and found out who she was, and I was, it was amazing. I should have photographed him photographing her, but I didn't. But that was my only connection with uh, her at that time. I had connected to other dancers. I photographed Alvin Ailey and all that whole group, and a lot of people to design clothes and stuff for him. Uh, I photographed Carmen de Avila um, and other dancers, but uh, not in Europe, in in the States. What about Ed Clark's crew in Paris when they were living? 
living. That's what I was. Oh, I see. No, I didn't know he had uh, met in Paris. Mrs. Clark. Yeah. Um, were you were you asking about yes, James Baldwin? Yes. When you were over there, was were there, you know, uh, you know, dancers or the jazz musicians because they were going over there at the same time. So I was wondering if there was any, you know, like Max Roach was always at every Elizabeth Catlett. You know, yeah. he was a big fan at her openings. Wherever she was, he was there until he passed. And I was wondering if there was anyone. I was just curious. If in Paris, um, no, not really. Not, not in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, Ed really wasn't connected to um, any musicians the way a lot of African-American painters and artists are. Mm -hmm. You know, like Adger was saying a lot, you know, listen to music or jazz while they're painting. Right. Um, I'd really, I guess he, who I'd always would hear him talk about was Ornette Coleman that he really um, admired. Um, there are no dancers that we were connected mm -hmm. to during that time. Um, among the... Um, I guess that the African-American artists that we ran into were usually um, painters, sculptors, or writers. Um, and then there were those that we kind of thought were working for the CIA if we couldn't really <laughs> pinpoint them to anything. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. 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 Thank you. And one of them actually was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I th that reminds me of something that Ed said, which was um, about, and Azure touched on, which was about wanting quiet and not, you know, not, not having, never having music on in the studio at all. Yeah. Um, but he also <laughs> said something about some of the artists that he would be speaking to as um, perhaps they wanted to be uh, Charlie Parker more than they wanted to be Picasso. Yeah. And, you know, this sense that jazz was the thing, intuition was the thing, but don't get it confused with what I'm doing. I'm, yeah. I'm a painter. I think we have one last question over here, Ali Tash. Oh, yeah. Um, as you know, Ed traveled everywhere from even Nigeria to Brazil, everywhere else. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. And then I, by knowing that he loved to go places to travel, I invited him to come to Los Angeles. I was away for a month and he came and he was supposed to do you know, a whole bunch of work. And I came back thinking that he's gonna have you know, a house full of painting. Of course, it wasn't a studio. I uh, gave him one room, which was a guest room. And I came and he did have one painting. <laughs> I said, what happened? You're supposed to work. He goes, no, this place intimidated me. I couldn't work. <laughs> so, but at the time, um, somebody called me about a painting from the 50s, from Colorado. I, for I forgot, it's been so long time ago. And she had it available for sale. And I told him about it. He goes, no, you can't sell that. I'm going to have to buy that. And he bought the painting. Um, anyway, I would love for you to tell people how much he traveled, and uh, oh, somebody. Um, Ed called me and said he was going to go to Martinique. Well, I had been to Martinique, and I had a lot of friends there. And so I called my friend and said, I got a painter friend of mine who's coming to find him a studio. So when he got there, my friend got him the studio. And when Ed came back, he said, man, he said, that was the greatest studio I ever had. He said it was a dirt floor. He said and half the wall was out. He said it was warm. He said, I threw shit everywhere. I didn't have to clean up. <laughs> and he did that whole Martinique series like that. He did a lot of work there. Because he didn't have to you know, clean up or anything. He, just, he could just paint. And one wall was out, so he was right by the sea. It was just, uh, he said it was an ideal studio, he really loved it. So I, I know that, you know, he traveled a lot to different places. Um, one funny story, we went to Chicago. When I met Ed, I mean, it was after I met Ed, and I had his studio one summer, <clears throat> and he had all these paintings rolled up, stacked one on top of another, just he had it everywhere. 
So when he came back, I said, Ed, you got to photograph this stuff. He said, I said, look, unroll them. I said, I'll photograph them, you know, four by five. He said, well, I got a lot of stuff in Chicago. <laughs> so he gets a car and we go to Chicago. And uh, at that time, they had these cars that you have a telephone and you can call the head, you know. And he's using them. He's called his sister. Now nah, I'm coming at you. Now we about... 20 minutes out, we're in a car. And he's like, you know, he's like, we got this fine car. Adger made me get a big car. I had a little car, and the motherfucker wanted me to get some big shit. He said, what is he doing? He said, oh, he had all this equipment, you know. So anyway, he's talking to his sister, and then he hangs up the phone. Two months later, he gets a bill for $250. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't hang the phone up. <laughs> he thought it was just talk and just put it on one side. But uh, I traveled with him and photographed a lot of his work in Chicago, a lot of the bigger pieces in this show. And uh, when we unfurled everything and I showed him all these, he started with a book. That is how he did the first book from all those photographs that I had done. But he never, you know, you know, Ed was messy, mm -hmm. you know, in this sloppy, and messy, <laughs> But that's the way he created. He worked circularly. He didn't work like, you know, he worked something over here, over there, and something messed over here, he might put it over here. You know, uh, and he'd have these brushes, and some of them would be hard, and he'd work with those, and some of them would be all washed out and nice. And, and he's had these shoes that paint all over him and sticks on the floor. <laughs> He just, that was the way he worked, circularly, as opposed to putting down a piece of canvas and doing one nice painting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he then, you know, he worked all over and around. So paint was everywhere, all over. His clothes on the wall and the windows, everywhere. Yeah. You know, but, you know, that was it. That's how he, that's how he um, generated this energy, you know, yeah, no, I, I can remember opening those tubes and seeing those tubes of predominantly works on paper, which, which I think is interesting in the context of his work. I mean, we, we're blessed with the paintings here, but what I remember was going to everybody's house and everybody had to work on paper. Mm -hmm. And they were often pastels, um, but that was, and you could really get a sense of how he physically worked um, directly from finger mm -hmm. onto Mm -hmm. uh, the, the composition it was incredible. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a facet of wanting to move about the world and mm -hmm. being able to continuously right. make work right. no matter yeah. where he was. I, I think we're ending. Hetty, did you want to add anything else? Or? I think a friend of mine, Alva, had a question over there. I didn't. Unfortunately, no. Um, cameras weren't as available, you know, then uh, as they are now. But um, yeah, we, we went by boat on the ship. Took us about five days. Ed got seasick <laughs> after he was telling me how to avoid it. As it turned <laughs> out, it was he who, who got sick. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bowser. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs>